Welcome to the weekly Wednesday Savage Worlds GM Hangout on Air. I'm your host, Jared Savage Daddy Gunning. Tonight's episode brought to you by Roll20.net, the world's largest virtual tabletop. Tonight's discussion is one sheets. Uh, not what are not only uh, which one sheets may be good or not so good, but also how to use them. What a one sheet is. We're guys gonna kind of walk you through and give some tips and uh, tricks with dealing with one sheets. And here to discuss it. The Savage Panel, Chris, the Savage Fox. Ah. Hello. Chris Fox, the Savage Mommy. Yeah, close enough. Iggy biggity boo. Uh, David, the Rules Maven Scott. Don't worry, you can always get this on iTunes. And Jason Jim Tryon of the Happy Jacks RPG Podcast. This podcast host has no name. So tonight we were talking about uh, one sheets. Um, this is a big issue, especially in the community and especially for new players and new GMs. Uh, we see a glut of um, posts in G Plus communities. I'm going to run my first Savage Worlds game, or I'm not comfortable with this genre. Can somebody give me a give me a um, one sheet suggestion or a setting suggestion? Now, my default argument has been. Uh, for the last month at least, you don't need one. Just go create your adventure. However, I understand that some people need that security blanket of, oh, well, I need something here to make me feel secure and confident in what I'm doing. So well, that's why we're... Go ahead. I was going to say, let's, let's not bypass the whole... Savage Worlds really get sold on the idea that it's zero prep. So there is a there's a big market as well for one sheets for lazy GMs who literally want zero. <laughs> okay, but that's not necessarily always. I, I, I'm not a lazy GM, but sometimes I don't have a lot of time. I have a job. I have a lot of shit that I do, and sometimes a one sheet is something to grab and build off of. Take Which is why idea. I said with a smile on my face, Chris. I'm, I'm not actually demonizing. I use them quite often yeah. myself. Um, um, I'm going to say jumping off. But I guess it can be for a lazy GM be, if you look at a lazy GM as, as a good thing. Like, hey, I'm going to take this and build off of it. I'm going to say this. Chris needs to get his priorities straight. I mean, what's more important, really? I mean, come on. <laughs> I am not going to to lay labels on why people choose to use use one sheets. Um, maybe they, you know, there, there are a lot of reasons well, why they might. Yeah, there's a number of reasons. They're good for and, inspiration and it does, sometimes. And it, the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter why. It it doesn't. Does it? It does not matter why. If oh, absolutely. If as a GM, you feel like. You know, this thing will help you run a game that's going to be more fun for you and your players. That's what you need to do. Bottom line, that's what you need to do. It's not what I do because I'm terrible at running other people's stuff. Stuff that other people yeah. have written, even if it's one page, I will, I will never, ever internalize it the way I do the stuff that I write. But if it helps you run a game that's more fun for you and your players, then that's what you need to do. Well, Jib's far more involved than the rest of us, obviously. I mean, <clears throat> Well, I mean, for me, I love to take a one-sheet, look at the, the basic structure of it. You know, um, uh, well, I'll use the one I've referenced before on the, on the show, Smuggler's Song. Smuggler's Song is a, is a really quick and dirty one-sheet for pirates where you're trying to smuggle goods on the shore, get them dropped off at th at several locations, and get back out to the to the rendezvous point before dawn. And the 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 crew has X amount of time to do it in, and you're actually given an instruction as the GM to watch the clock, and every so many minutes of play, tell them this many hours have passed in game. The interesting aspect for for me with that is grabbing that concept to play with time and actually build it into the structure of the of the night. I don't necessarily need to run that one sheet word for word the way it has to be able to grab that concept and, and use it. So there's a lot of different ways to use one sheets. 
Agreed. Agreed. Uh, and in case I didn't mention it, which I know I didn't mention it, um, the Q&A app is running. If you're watching the streaming live and want to participate in the show, ask questions, feel free. Um, so there's there's a number, and, and one sheet's existed uh, precluding the uh, Savage Worlds Deluxe release. So if you um, go and get one sheets from Pinnacle's, down, uh, from Pinnacle's uh, site, uh, you absolutely can. They're, most of them are free to download. Uh, but you may run across some that, especially for the horror uh, ones, are either built for the original toolkits, which preceded the companions, or they're written for the actual companions, which may, some of them may precede the uh, Savage Worlds Deluxe. So, for example, in some of them you may see guts. Let's say I pick up a horror one sheet. It may give me a, a stat in there for a villain or a bad guy that says guts. Uh, you could argue you could use it in a in a one sheet, but with the change in uh, deluxe to make it spirit roll instead, you could kind of play with that. The one thing to consider though is that deluxe doesn't completely get rid of guts. Deluxe says use guts in these kind of specific situations if you feel the need to do so. So that's a that's definitely something to pay attention to. Is was the one sheet written to use it? And then take a look. Is it just on the character sheets, or is there actually like in the one sheet somewhere that talks about guts where you may actually need to have it on character sheets, or you may have to do that wrangling to turn it into a spirit mechanic for that particular playthrough, depending on the way you want to run it. But I wouldn't just say, look for the word guts, and then, you know, if they've got a D6 guts, give them a D6 and something else. I would absolutely take a look at why they have guts in there. Right. And just the the point I'm trying to make, the point we're trying to make is, don't assume that the one sheet is up to date with the current version of Savage Worlds, is is really what we're saying. Uh, Because Dustin in here states that he had to update the weapon stats uh, when he ran the mutator. So one of the other things you want to... First of all, let's talk about what a one-sheet is. Um, a one-sheet is just that. It's supposed to be a one-sheet adventure, front and back, that you can print out and just run a game with, a two-hour, four-hour game with. They're excellent for convention settings. They really are. They're excellent for, like, uh, your regular normal gaming group gets together and suddenly somebody has to cancel. Uh, screw it. We'll just whip out a one-sheet and play a one-sheet. The thing to remember is that they're not a few tips when running a one sheet. They're not going to really, I haven't seen one yet that tells you what setting rules for Savage Worlds apply. I've seen a couple. Really? Okay. If they don't say otherwise, because I've seen a couple too, and if they don't say otherwise, my assumption would be that they use core rules as written. Yeah, right. I, I've always assumed that if it doesn't specifically call out setting rules, that it's not using any. But it's like, well, I, I know I mentioned Smuggler Song. I know it actually calls out that there's specific ones that are used for it. So, um, again, I think it's... Although, I will say this, the ones I've seen that call them out are the ones that are released by Peck. I right. don't necessarily know if that's true if you get them where they've been released either as a Savage fan or as a licensee. Right, and I think right. it's obviously the ones that have been written since Deluxe. Right, and my, what I'm saying is you, yeah, and you want to take that into you want to take that into account when you're looking at the one sheet. So, for example, if I'm running a, a horror one sheet, blood and guts, where I can reroll, spend biddings to reroll damage, may be appropriate for this for that adventure. Um, Joker's Wild may or may not be appropriate for that adventure, depending on whether you plan on being stingy with the bennies as a GM, or if you just uh, just want to have the Joker's Wild in there, it's fine as well. There's, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. But make sure that you take a look at the adventure and double-check, okay, am I on point with the genre of what this adventure is about, the setting that it's taking place in, and do I need to add or redact uh, certain setting rules uh, from core? or just run core rules as written, period. Everything goes. Um, the nice thing about a one sheet is right there in the header, it's going to tell you, it's going to give you a, be, a brief one or two sentence blurb about the adventure. It's going to give you a little, basically a little plot summary. 
what it will do is most of them will tell you, here's the setup, here's the the action, here's the aftermath. Uh, it's kind of a three-act, quasi-three-act design. The thing that you'll notice when you read through a one-shot, and feel free, guys, to jump in any time if uh, you feel something differently, is it's not going to tell you exactly what happens step by step. It's not going to go, first the party does this, then this happens, then this happens. Uh, what it's going to do is it's going to give you a set of basically disconnected scenes. Uh, it may have you starting in one location and tell you during that adventure they start here, but they quickly move out of this location. But it's not like the old D&D or old role-playing modules of the, of the 80s or 90s where it's chronological step order of what happens in the adventure. I would almost say a lot of them are, like I, like I said earlier, and I don't know that I put this word on it, but a framework. Yeah, yeah. I would agree yeah. with that. That's, uh, that's it, a it's... Good. But, then, but then that mirrors the way plot point settings are designed. Is, is that to a certain extent. There's a, a loose implied order of things, but it's kind of like, well, it's here. And when your people get here, the thing happens. Right, yeah. If your people never get here, the thing happens anyway, but they don't know about it, and they can't do anything about it. Well, I know more with, like, plot points or actual one-shots, not one-sheets, and they are two very different things within the Savage community. One-shots typically will actually have, like, written-out dialogue for you to read verbose to the, to the character, to the players at the table. Whereas one sheets never have that. the The average one sheet will might give you a catchphrase at most to have an NPC say, but I'm it sure. never gives you any dialogue. Whereas one shots and plot points will oftentimes actually give you whole blocks of dialogue that are part of the exposition I, necessary for the kind of the long running. I, I guess story because if I were going to run a plot point that's one of the things from the plot point that I wouldn't use. It wouldn't do me any good. Because nothing, nothing in my opinion will kill a game faster than for someone to read block text from the book. And, yeah. Yeah, it's the one spot where with anything I've run that has it, I always modify what's said. I always try to paraphrase it, make it my own before I read it to the players. And that's if I don't just throw it out completely. Um, I know ETU had a lot of really kind of stilted stuff in the first couple of adventures where here's this character and this is what this character is going to say and this is what's going to happen in that room. And you were really wrapped in a box that you had no way out of as a GM that a lot of that stuff I had to completely break apart and... You have to. You really have to dig into some of the the plot point stuff to find a way to get that exposition in in your own words. If you go away from their dialogue, whereas one sheets, like Chris said, it's a basic framework. Here's the guy. Here's his motivation. Go, <laughs> and it leaves you completely. Right. And, and, here's the, and here's the information he has, but it doesn't give you a big old block of text. It, it gives right. you this is the information he has, and then you can disseminate that to the player characters how you see fit. Right. Now, one thing I will say I absolutely love with the one sheets that do this are some of the best written ones out there will have things like, in this location, here's the clue, give it to the players. If a player makes a notice roll to search the area, here is broken down by success, raise, multiple raises, the extra stuff they also can find. But whatever the gimme is in the scene that moves the plot forward for the one sheet is just a gimme. It's, it's not tied to a notice roll at all. And I, I really like that format. And I've only seen it in a few of them. But it's absolutely the best way to do that. I think that's it gives a, you something to give to the player. Yeah, I think that's a great way to approach that problem in general. You know, is on an, if there's something they need to find to move the story forward, they're going to find it. But they have to make a notice roll. Why? Because if they roll a success, 
Okay, they find the thing. Cool, no problem. They were going to find a thing anyway. If they get a raise, they find the thing plus extra, extra information. If they fail, they still find the thing, but something bad happens. Some problem arises as a result of it. Yeah, but on this the is an idea of... that every that every savage GM needs to keep in mind for every fucking game we run. Yeah, but on the flip side of that, I would also say on one sheets, watch for, and I think I said this a couple weeks ago, watch for those things that they put in there that aren't needed. The players ride their horses into the middle of town square, make a notice roll. If they make the notice roll, they see these six bodies in the middle of town square, uh, you know, ru- uh, tied up to, like, giant crosses. No, they see that before they ever get right. to town square, because it's an eight-foot cross of a man's yeah, and, my, and my thought is, my thought is, okay, why did they, what was that notice check for? I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Well, and... And here's the thing too, and I'm I'm gonna just uh, dive for for just a second. Uh, one of the one of the uh, original uh, older horror uh, one sheets is a one sheet by the name uh, called Winter Break, uh, and this was written for the horror toolkit. So it's here's and here's the setup: students trapped by a winter storm find themselves investigating their professor's disappearance. Use the horror characters found at Savage Worlds uh, website. Uh, at, at Peg Inc., uh, you could also use any of the bestiary uh, characters from the uh, toolkit or horror companion. So that's just the that's just the blurb right there. That's what this adventure is about. And then it just immediately jumps into it and starts with a, a labeled heading that says "Storm Warning." So the heroes are students at Carthage College in Wisconsin and members of the Paranormal Psychology Club, which meets to discuss ghostly sightings. UFO lore and other paranormal activity. The club is led by Professor James Linden. So we can see where this is going. Like the next header is missing. The office is a shambles. Uh, the one who is calling for help. So if they do uh, go and lights flicker, it gives you some ideas that cellular phone services are going to work. All the roads to and from campus are blocked. At certain certain point, a howling demon shows up, so it's got its own little section for when that's appropriate, and gives you some uh, a little bit of insight on how to discuss it. It will also give you uh, the Carthage Herald, which is the school newspaper. If they use that to investigate it, it gives you some bullet points about the investigation role, about certain students who were sacrificed or suffocated, blah 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 blah. And then there's uh, the big reveal, spoiler alert, there was a summoning of this demon in the professor's home, and that's why he's gone. That's where they eventually end up. That's your entire one sheet. Now, the back of it, the back of it has an aftermath, and it tells you if the summoning is averted, uh, everyone, and we do mean everyone dies. Oh, sorry, if the summoning isn't averted. That would be the Savage Daddy version. <laughs> uh, if it isn't averted. The, the, the summoning has been averted. You're all dead anyway. You die anyway. You all die. die. You die so less grotesquely, like less night. painfully, but you're all dead. Yeah, that would be my version. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. If the summoning is stopped, the professor and the students have a lot of explaining to do. It will give you um, a chaos priest for bestiary entry, the four hundred minions for B theory entry. Uh, it shows you a little kind of a cut out piece of note paper that you can leave as a clue. But here's the thing, it does not tell you here's how you run the adventure. Yeah, it doesn't actually give you much Any at all in how to run this. It just gives you this is the adventure. Very, very base frame, like like Chris was saying earlier. It's Here's some tent poles. How you decide to turn this into a tent is up to you. <laughs> right, That's so if you're, gonna, if, if you're going to create pre-gens or you're going to allow players to create their own characters for this one sheet, you may want to put some stipulations in place. Hey, you're all college students. Nobody has any skill above a D8, period, and maybe you only have one or two. Um, no, not everybody has fighting and shooting D8. No, you're college students. I expect to see well, some people Texas. with investigation. I'm Things from like Texas. that. 
My daddy bought me a lifelong membership in the NRA when I was five years old. Congratulations, you have a D6 shooting. Now shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and so, D6 is average, so that's just fine. The other thing to keep in mind, too, is if you're creating pregens, make sure the hindrances uh, are actual hindrances that can be played during the adventure. Giving somebody wanted major for a big bad enemy who has nothing to do with this adventure is not going to... It, it, it kind of robs the player of a, a way to earn bennies and a way to roleplay uh, that character during the adventure. Yeah, I think um, with the, the key with any pre-gen, and we've talked about this before, is build the pre-gen you need for that game, hang the rules, hang right. the, the deep constructive where we've talked about, you know, don't give them all mean, don't, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Hang a lot of that stuff and look specifically at what can you put on that character sheet that in under five minutes communicates the character to the player so that they can actually role play it for the evening. Because if you give them something that they can't role play as far as a hindrance, yeah, like Jared said, you're taking away the opportunity to earn pennies, but you're also wasting space on that character sheet that doesn't actually help them role play that character. Because if, you know, oh, they're wanted in another state by this crime organization, but what's the player going to do? Occasionally look over his shoulder to see if the mob showed up at the closed-off college campus that the roads are blocked? No. It's, that brings uh, us to a very critical point about characters in general. Don't put something on the character sheet that's not going to come up in play. Ever. The, yeah, these, and these are the not, put, and, characters. They're and if the player puts something on their character sheet, they are saying... I want this to come up in play. I want this to be a thing. Or they thought, this will never come up in play. I won't have to suffer the consequences, so I'm going to put it on my character sheet. Either way, um, uh, it's a red that's flag to the GM. I well, either way, either way, it's a red flag to the GM to bring it up. Go ahead, if Chris. you're making the, the PCs and it's, it's going to be one of those one-shots, you're using a one-sheet for a one-shot, I would almost say, too, don't be beholden to the actual character creation rules. Oh, absolutely. Oh, right. exactly create, them you said, with yeah. Whatever, mm-hmm. yeah, create them with whatever you need. Don't don't worry about it. Uh, you know, I've had that happen a few times where I've gotten those rules lawyer players at a table, and they're like, well, this guy's got one extra hindrance. Uh, yeah, he does. Well, why? Because <laughs> I gave it to him. It fits, what's, it fits the game. I don't create my, my pre-gens as PCs. I create them as pre-gens. That yeah, I create them mean. using the yeah, same rules as NPCs. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, hold on a second. Is that what fits oh. now? Hold on a second. Uh, Chris, my response as a game master to that player, that rules lawyer is, uh, well, go ahead and read the section on hindrances because I could take as many as I want as a player character, but I only right. get credit for four points. Yeah. So, no, that does not break the rules. You can absolutely take more hindrances and then role play them to have, have more hooks for bennies, um, but but your GM is absolutely going to force them upon right. you as well. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> take that with a grain of salt, but with a pregen, absolutely. So, I'm going I'm to create a character specifically with a a spanking bottom that hangs out and is marked with a big red X called its hindrances. That as a GM, I'm planning to hit you for that hindrance. I'm going to put the guy in that has glasses, planning that at some point in the night, his glasses are getting knocked off. Why? Because as a GM, when I'm creating that character, and we're in a you know a survival horror thing, where you're in this you know college campus up in the mountains, and there's no way he can go get another pair of glasses, I want him to face that struggle. That's It's part of what I'm, you know, as a GM, wanting the story to have as a challenge. So I'm going to cr- put that character in there with that hindrance. Well, and here's, That is here's completely the, acceptable, isn't it? Absolutely. And here's the thing, too. If, especially if you're doing something that's a pop culture conversion as a one-sheet, uh, one-shot. For example, let's say we're going to do Scooby-Doo. Uh, Velma has the hindrance bad eyes. And she has it major. However, in that game setting, I as a GM put a note 
that she is considered blind without her glasses. Not she bad eyesight. Be. She's considered absolutely freaking blind without her glasses because that's who the character is in the cartoon. Um, Scooby and Shaggy have have yellow. Both of them have the yellow major hindrance. They <laughs> also have everything else they have. <laughs> they also have uh, glutton as a habit major hindrance. If they don't eat a huge amount of snack foods and stuff every every four hours, I mean, and feel free to modify the edges of the hindrances to fit your one sheet or to fit your to fit your one shot adventure. But um, we just say that as hanged rules. Absolutely right. You do not just like you don't go through and use the character creation to create extras or your wild card NPCs. For a one sheet, you don't do that for the for the pre generated characters either, because you're creating showcase characters that are supposed to interact with each other and this specific storyline. So that you're I creating. do want to interject one small thing, and that is if you are writing this one sheet to include in a book of other one sheets to be played as additions to a plot point, you absolutely need to figure out what power level you've created those pre-gen characters at and put that somewhere in the in the one sheet when you're creating it so that someone who picks it up knows, hey, this is designed for seasoned characters. It comes with some seasoned characters on the back, but if I'm already running ETU and I want to run Jared's, you know, Lost in the Mountains... Um, one sheet, I know I need to not run that until the players are at seasoned, or it's going to be a bigger challenge, or it's going to be a weaker challenge if they're already heroic or you know, uh, further on. So that's something else to keep in mind, is hang the rules, absolutely create the pregens you need for the, for the one sheet, but at the same time, keep a general eye, eye on how powerful those characters are, so you can also have some power parity among the party. You don't want one player playing a legendary character while another player plays a novice character in a one sheet. That's that might be great for your for your normal game, but in a one sheet, that's a lot to expect of a player who's going to sit down blind to play this. So we we've we've talked about what a one sheet is, where to go find them. Um, you can find them on the Big Ink website under uh, I think shop the shop editing. I think so. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to get to the website right now. I, yeah, you it's go down under, right now. Go under games and then go to one sheets. There you go. It's games. Not sorry, not, not shop. Uh, the majority of them are free. Oh yeah, a good number of them are. Yeah. Uh, there's some that aren't. I didn't even know that. I think there's some that are like a dollar ninety nine for some of the newer, some of the newer like uh, Rippers Resurrected, hmm. things like that. There, there may be some that actually charge a small fee for the one sheet. I but think by, the by ones, large, they're free. I think the ones that actually have a charge are also the ones that appear in some of the volume books, where it's like the, there was those that three volume set that came out of horror one sheets. There I you think go. some of those one sheets that you can buy individually, or you can buy the volume. But again, I don't have access to the website, so that's just me yeah. kind of grabbing at what I maybe kind of remember. But They're I do know sorted. there are licensees that sell one sheets. Yeah, mm -hmm. I see a lot on Google Plus, just free one sheets. Yeah, a lot of Google fan one sheets on Google Plus. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna address something here very quickly. Uh, this is completely off topic, but I'm gonna address something for Gary here quickly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Dead horse. Gary, Gary has seen that the Sin City Savages website with the redesign has become viewable to the general public. Uh, it had to be in order to fix the iTunes the subscription service. Um, he writes, I see that the Sin City website has come up early. Uh, when are we are when are we getting some ground zero one sheets? Um, you're not. Uh, <laughs> um, and that kind of leads us into our next topic. You can write your own. <laughs> You absolutely can write your own one sheet, and it's a very simple process. It really is. If, if you want to be really fancy about it and you have some OCD like yours truly, you will take a Microsoft Word, you will create a three-column layout presentation, and you will use headers 
and you'll have a header image, and you'll have a background image, and you'll do all this crazy stuff to make it look like a professional. I, I don't know what you're talking about or what's, why you think there's something wrong with that. Uh, and, I and don't. And you'll convert it to PDF before you send it to your um, friend to, right. to have them look it over and, and, uh, Again, and right. fact check it I, for I don't you. see a problem so. with this equation because <laughs> that's how I do it. So, uh, well, okay. <laughs> but, the, but those of us on this panel are not the average GM. Let's just be honest here. I'm just that's, calling uh, it space. That's pretty true. That's pretty true. So, I mean, I'll I'll just walk everybody through. I created when we were doing the the uh, actual plays for ETU while it was still in its Kickstarter phase. Um, I created a one sheet. As a fill-in, because at the time, I think there were only two one-sheet adventures and we wanted to do a three-session three, three session actual play. So the Beelzebubba uh, episode that you see there is a one-sheet that I created to fill that, me to fill that need. So what you're going to find is I came up with the general premise being that there is an ETU alumni by the name of Jed Beal who... Uh, Suffered a major injury. Holy shit! Who's got a Harley? Suffered a major injury uh, in the, in the 70s or 80s uh, that he blames this uh, particular frat for, and has been plotting his revenge for 20 years by summoning a demon to take them all to hell. That was the general conceit. That would be your one little line across the top. Then it just starts with the setup, and it could be like, you know, Halloween party at the frat house. That's where the adventure begins. Uh, it's Halloween. The freshmen have been invited to the keg frat, so we made it K-E-G for the actual uh, alphanumeric as a pun on a beer keg. Uh, give a short description of the frat house. Like there's some, you know, uh, joke gravestone marker names there. Um, people are filing in and out. Uh, if you're in costume, great. If you're not, I think we put in some little bonus if you were in costume. Like you started with an extra Benny if, you, if the player actually spent part of their allowance for a costume. But then it just moved on to what's you know what's going on. There's uh, this the actual party itself. Now, because there was the potential for the player characters to possibly get involved in a keg stand competition... And that we were using tainted, spellcrafted beer to mutate everybody. I just included a small little thing on, like, here's how you do whether or not they're drunk. A small little note on a mechanic about whether or not they're drunk. It's for every 8-ounce glass they drink, for every 5 8-ounce glasses they drink, they have to make a vigor roll to negative 2 or suffer a level of fatigue to be drunk. That's simple. Then we just said, this is what happens. This breaks out. Uh, everybody turns into basically blah, blah, blah. Here's what's going on upstairs. Jed's incapable of doing the, the whole thing. Uh, we talked about in it how, Jed's, you know, how Jed got into the frat house before the party. So there's a little blurb that there's a white van parked across the street from the brewery that delivered the kegs. And if the players decide to investigate, they find a 44 revolver uh, in the glove compartment. Otherwise, they have no weapons. And then Boom, boom, boom. No maps needed. None of that. It's just this real simple play out of if they, you know, here's what happens. Here's what happens in this location at this time. Here's what happens at this location at this time. For a, if a character wants to figure out that the name of the brewery that delivered is actually an anagram or mixed, I never get this right. It's not anagram. So when you take all the letters and words and jumble them together to spell completely different words, that's an anagram. Okay. An anagram. Oh, I had it right then. That the uh, name of the brewery printed on all the kegs was actually Lord of the Flies, an anagram of Lord of the Flies. Then they had to have a knowledge occult or knowledge cult role. So there's little things that you can post and flavor in there, but you're just making up your own adventure. It could be as simple as uh, let's let's talk for Gary real quick since we're talking about Ground Zero. Um, you guys are all uh, underdwellers, your vault dwellers, and you need a new air filtration system. Uh, in eight days, the current filter system is no longer going to sustain everybody's going to suffocate to death. 
So you're sent out into the beyond to find replacement parts to fix it, and then you're chased down by marauders. Between point A and point B, points, but you get to point C, you can barter for it, you can take it, whatever. Point D, you get home, you install it. There's your one shot. Write it up. Make a note for yourself about how the chase breaks down, how you're going to use chase rules, or if you're going to use chase rules, or what happens you know, if that, you know that could be, What you just said could be even written on a half a sheet. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. You could, a notebook, a couple of index cards, you could write a one sheet adventure on a couple of index yeah, cards. pretty much. Yeah, and then you take the – if you're trying to write a one sheet, the the biggest thing to remember is make sure you're leaving yourself space on that page to give the bestiary info for those marauders that Jared just said you're going to come in contact with, the um, stats for the guy who runs the location that you're going to to barter for the air filter. Whether they get into a combat with them or they get into a social conflict with them, how will they handle getting the device? The GM needs those stats. So you're going to want to make sure you have a stat block there. That's going to take up a third of your one sheet just in stat blocks. Yep. Well, and, and, and doing the one sheet also kind of gives you an inventory checklist of what you need to be prepared with. As low prep as Savage Worlds is, like we just said, you need to know. Well, who's the who's the guy in charge of the you know the location? If it's, town. if it's Barter Town, yeah, uh, is he willing to go? Only willing to give it to them if they go do him another favor. Uh, you know, however you decide to do it, it's how you decide to do it. But what you lay out in that little story outline kind of tells you, hey, here's what you need to go make sure you prep. You need to prep the Marauders. You need to be familiar with chase rules. Maybe you want to have the chase rules chart up in front of you when you're running the game. So one thing I like to do when I'm trying to design these is I'll also think about, so what's the, what's the goal I want the players to achieve in the one sheet? That is, go get this air filter. What is the worst thing that could happen on the way there or the way back? And that's the conflict you add to the one sheet. It's, you know, attacked by marauders, uh, sandstorm, whatever. Doesn't matter. Pick one thing to add to it. One. That's the key to a one sheet. There's one source of major conflict. A great example of this is the Crime City one sheet that they have on the PEG site that used to be in the core rules. Now they've put the second version of that, the Chase one, in the core rules, and they give the the Crime City one away free on the website. It has one conflict. It has one group of bad guys, one location that you're going to fight them in, one reason to fight them. It sets the players up with a little preamble, a little aftermath, a goal that they have to achieve, and one major conflict. That's what makes it a one sheet, is there's really a very succinct thing they have to do. Smuggler song I talked about earlier. The challenge is not the deliveries they have to make throughout the night. It's get back to the boat in this amount of time. It, you know, Pick that one thing that's the challenge for your one sheet, and that should take up the bulk of your, of your page. Yep. Yeah. Um, I, I'm an outliner. That, that's how I approach things like this. So it's like I will start with a blank page, and I use a, a notepad because, you know, it's just... Scribble it down. If I don't like it, mark it out. It's just fast. Um, you know, one, where are they starting? What's the problem that they need to deal with? You know, what are the, you know if they go here, what are they going to encounter? What's going to be there? If they, you know, where are they going to get the thing that's going to draw them into this thing that's going on? And, you know, what are the things that might be happening? Who's involved? What do they, you know... I don't go into the kind of depth about things like what do they care about and things like that for a one sheet, um, but you know, it's it's a simple outline. And then I, right. I do like Jared. I format it how I want it to be. I usually use two columns instead of three, but whatever, you know, go with what works with what, what makes sense for what how you want to view it. Um, and one of the, the things that just speaks so eloquently to the beauty and the uh, 
and, and the power uh, of the Savage World system is that you can write a, a, a pretty deep and rich game on one page. Mm-hmm. And, have, and you're, you're not having some chintzy little, you know, know-nothing adventure. It's got, you've got space for depth and, mm-hmm. and intrigue and interest and things that are going to capture people's attention. I've read one sheets before that even after they present a fairly deep, engaging um, event for your players to experience, they have room on the page left over to introduce a brand new setting rule. Two, mm-hmm. three paragraphs of the space left over on that page to give you a brand new setting rule that completely changes the way the game's played. And they have room to do that alongside this because a one sheet is a very focused thing. It's it's one session. Sometimes I guess you could split it into three sessions if you're Cameron and really like to spread them out, but they're really kind of designed to be one session. So there's a lot you can do to play with that just knowing how, you know, really good GMs out there, you know what your players are capable of tackling in a single session. You know better than anybody who's got a, a license to the different uh, settings what your players can tackle. Write your one sheet targeted to your table. Yep. Mm-hmm. And yeah, uh, here's one. here's something you'll also see in a couple of one sheets, the way they're formatted. Uh, there'll be a section called What's Really Going On? And that will tell you, oh, this is what's really happening. The, the professor has right. disappeared. Or and it's that's pretty much GM's eyes only. That is kind of what it's giving you is a hey. Psst. Apart hey, from the adventure, here's what's really happening and, and why we're here's doing the this. little man behind the curtain and what and the levers he's pulling to make all this happen. Right, and it, it helps to have that. It also helps to have the the aftermath session. Like there's one of two outcomes that can happen here. Now, <coughs> excuse me. It's just as easy to let's. Uh, end your game with a final chase a foot, uh, using the chase rules. Go, hey, five-round chase. If the players if the players get away, they are free from the asylum and they get away, end of story. If they don't get away, they're, and I'm talking about the mutator in particular. Uh, the mutator is one that uh, we just ran through the other, the other night. Um, instead of just endless combat and combat and combat and the players trying to get away, then more rounds of combat and combat. As a GM, you can just go, we're going to put a bow on this, we're going to do a... Here's the here's the aftermath. Chase. You're going to do a chase, foot chase, through the asylum. If the players win at the, the end of the five rounds, if they're still alive, they're free. If anyone dies or the other side wins, they're all dragged back in the theater and turned into hideous mutations. And that's just where the story ends. And that's your aftermath. And you're done. So, I mean, you can end, totally end stuff like that on a chase or a dramatic task. Anything that exists in Savage Worlds, feel free to do it and you just make a note to yourself, see chase rules, and then just for yourself, page, whatever, blah, blah, blah. So, in summary, a lot of great free resources for one-shots uh, available from the PEG website, available from other licensees. Which just um, came back up, by the way. Awesome. Make sure that you're paying attention to the the spirit of the adventure you're running and make sure that the characters of pre-gens sort of fit in line with it. Uh, any setting rules that enhance that are there or you're not running setting rules that are contrary. Uh, and if you get to a certain point, we'll start writing your own. Uh, you can always sit down and take a couple of hours on a weekend just as a goof and create a one sheet, and then store it away in your notebook, and then later on just pull it out and use it. Feel free. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead, and I see we have a couple of uh, other... We have one from Jeremiah Roche. Uh, who wants to read that? I was hoping he was going to finish it. <laughs> it looks like he got about halfway through typing it and hit enter. Um, but he says, So as a new player and GM to Savage Worlds, not to mention role-playing in general... What rules would? Okay. Assuming there's more to this. 
<laughs> well, then in the meantime, we'll go ahead and address Eric's question. Uh, although there aren't one sheets, although they aren't one sheets, Savage Tales of Horror introduced setting rules for the particular venture, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Like you could have a buckets of blood type from the you could take the buckets of blood from the horror companion and insert it into your your one sheet. Uh, uh, sorry, suggest. suggest. What rules would we suggest? Uh, it really wow, depends on the genre. Yeah, it's it's too big of an open thing. I, you know, if it's uh, space pirates, you know, you probably want to do blood and guts and Joker's Wild. If it's um, you know, if you're talking more horror, you you might want to throw in there fanatics and um, uh, gritty damage, so that the enemies never die. There's always a zombie to jump in the way, but the heroes are constantly taking injuries along with their wounds to really hammer home that that no one has power um, right. feel. It, it's I would say that's way too open to what you're playing, and also what's fun to your players. You might have a group of players who hate a particular part of Savage Worlds and don't want to see it, so maybe your setting rule is no dramatic tasks no matter what happens. I, I don't know. <laughs> no interludes. No interludes. Things like that. Interludes are fun. Embrace them. All right, we'll wrap this up because uh, you know, here's the obligatory question, then we'll go to Pip It, Pip It. From Gary, favorite one sheets or ones you think are good and worth looking into? Uh, he states that he played Daddy's Boy and thought it was good. Uh, from Deadlands, I, Chris, I, I favorite one sheet. Uh, one I just would be good? I just recently uh, for two I had two people who were brand new to Deadlands, and so I read The Crow, and they really liked, They really had a good time with it. Except that you were supposed to make a notice check to notice six bodies in the middle of town square. Right. But it was good. It was good. They had. They seemed to have a good time with it. And that's a dead. Like I said, that's a Deadlands adventure. But you could tweak it to a horror game. You could really make it pretty much. You could tweak it to a sci-fi game, really, without with very little work. Cool. Dave, do you have a favorite or one you would suggest? Ah, uh, actually looked at the Peg Inc. website. I actually, no, I'm pulling up uh, Deluxe because that's the one. I just don't remember the name of it. Um, but there's one in there, and it is called Salvage of the USS Kane. Yep. Um, A sample invention for the back of Deluxe. Yeah, it is. It's right in the core book, so it's absolutely free if you if you've got the book the book. Um, and the best part of USS Kane is it actually throws some things at you that are mind-bending GM tasks as one of the first things you'll ever play. G dealing with zero gravity, dealing with the, the hazard of the cold of space, you know, deal dealing with some of these different things are really, really interesting concepts that Savage Worlds handles. Bam, here's a really simple rule for it, and move on. Yeah. And, it, and that's, that's a pre, really, pre-sci-fi companion. Yeah, that's pre a pre-sci-fi sci -fi companion. Yeah. This, is, this is just core rules, really simple way of handling these kind of complex things for that genre, and it, it just handles it very quickly and easily, and it teaches you as a GM to take that step back and, and start thinking with Savage Worlds. You know, it, it was a common thing they said about uh, the game Portal, when you start thinking with portals, the game gets way easier and completely different and a lot more fun. But with Savage Worlds, when you play something like this and you start thinking with Savage Worlds, it'll change your entire perspective of the game system. Cool. So, Jib, you don't you don't have a favorite or one that I, you would? I don't really have a favorite. I haven't um I haven't actually run any something? of them. Is there one you've considered running, but haven't? That sticks out. Um, there was one, it's actually not a one-shot, but it's it's done in one page in the book. Um, and it's the lead-in adventure for Slipstream. The Wild Hunt? Yeah. That's a one-shot. Oh, did they do it as a one-shot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that I read when I was getting ready to run Slipstream, and it was like, this is the, char the, the characterization that the game is looking for, so. Right. Cool. Um, I'm a big fan of the Mutator. I mean, 
it's a uh, very Cthulhu Cthulhu esque. Um, it's no. almost almost a Silent Hill. It's really got a, a creepy, creepy Silent Hill nurses hospital mad doctor kind of feel to it. Um, it's it's only only really consists of like three scenes. There's a hospital room, a hallway, and then the the main operating theater. Uh, I enjoyed that one. Um, the Hanging Tree for Deadlands was an interesting one shot, as is The Crow for Deadlands. I mean, if you really want to, if you really want to go through one sheets in Savage Worlds, take a look at basically the Dead the Deadlands catalog, because that probably has the most amount of one sheets available, and yeah. there are some yeah. really cool story concepts. I mean, you don't need to use the actual one sheet. You could take, you could run Daddy's Boy as a sci-fi. I mean, if you're like, okay, I'm gonna, I want to do a Savage Firefly, and I've kind of got it worked out. Now I need an adventure. Go grab a Deadlands one sheet and slap some ray guns and spaceships in it. And you're done. Go. Um, but yeah, I, I those to me are the ones that stand out. Um, the Hanging Tree one was really, really good. A lot of fun because of the because basically it's a villain. The idea that there's this uh, possessed tree that's hanging people is just awesome. Um, but that's a and uh, Eric uh, suggests the taxidermist tale spelled T A I L. Let's see what you did there. Nice nice double entendre. I, so, I would just say this. I mean, since Eric has been you know plugging stuff, I'll plug something for him. Uh, forget about it, that he and Morn Schnapp just put out has been getting a lot of traction in the digital play space. I know some people have been posting their actual plays of it for Roll20 and on Fantasy Grounds, and it looks really good. I haven't personally played it, so I don't, I can't comment my experience with it, but I know it is getting a lot of review time right now, and people seem to like it. So and that's out there, too. So with that, we'll roll into Pimp It, Pimp It, Chris. Pimp It, Pimp It. Uh, Savage Cast, go out, give us a listen. We're on iTunes. Uh, we're on Stitcher. You can go to our website, savagecast.com. Uh, go give us a listen. We're going to be meeting this Saturday to work on our next couple of shows. Sweet. Awesome. Jib. Pivot, pivot. As always, the Happy Jacks RPG podcast. You can find us on social media. You can find us on iTunes. You can find us at happyjacks.org. Um, we stream live most Friday nights, though sometimes we do it on Saturday morning just to shake things up. Um, also, um, I think the Kickstarter is still going on. Um, the good folks at Prismatic Tsunami have a Kickstarter going on for their game convention, which is in October. Um, they, they need your help, so show them some love. Awesome. Dave, Pivot Pivot. So I'm only on the GM Hangout, so I can't pimp my other podcast. Um, what I will say is this. Uh, Steam has got a great sale going on right now. Um, they're, they're doing their Steam summer sale. And if you look at the Fantasy Grounds entries on there, it's ranging anywhere from 20 to like 80% off on some of the stuff that's available. I know like for 80 bucks, you can literally get everything they've ever released for Deadlands Reloaded for Fantasy Grounds plus the core Fantasy Grounds license you can run for I any number of people. So, I mean, that's a great deal that's going on right now, uh, taking advantage of that. Because it's Fantasy Grounds is one of those things people always talk about how expensive it is to start. <laughs> Grab it during a summer sale, and you can get it for 60% off. So there's that. Um, for those of you who are playing at the table, <laughs> I saw one of the, probably the greatest things I've seen in a long time. It's called All Rolled Up. They sell a selection of little pouches that you put your books and dice and pencils and markers and minis into. But along with it, you can buy a travel dice tray that rolls up inside of it. And it's a little piece of like neoprene or wool cloth with snaps in the corners. So it snaps up into this little like felt bowl for you to roll your dice in. Absolutely ingenious. Um, and it's allrolledup.co.uk. It's a British company. They're only like eight pounds, and you know, thanks to the political uh, upheaval going on in Great Britain, that means it's about eight bucks to buy it right now. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I have one of their dice bags. I love it. Yeah, I, I saw that, and it was like, okay, I know what I'm pimping later. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, they're cool. I already went and looked on the site today thinking about buying one. Okay, uh, as far as the uh, Sensei Savages site goes, uh, spoilers from uh, Gary. Yes, the coming soon uh, screen has been dropped. Uh, you'll see a, a, a brand new re redesign of the site. Uh, if you want to go take a look now, you'll get a uh, peek behind the curtain. Um, as soon as I publish the next podcast episode, the uh, maintenance page is going back up because uh, I want to kind of keep that hidden. Uh, so we're uh, moving forward with a rebrand on that. Uh, follow us on Facebook at SWGMH. Uh, same on Twitter, SWGMH. Uh, on iTunes, or yeah, on iTunes, we're still at the same podcast address. On YouTube, we're still at the same channel address uh, currently. Uh, there is one uh, thing I do want to pimp. I received an email uh, earlier this week uh, from a viewer and a fan uh, talking about their company and wanted want to know if we would go ahead and pimp it, pimp it. And I will definitely, after taking a look at their uh, website, they have a website and Patreon. So go take a, check them out. They're Rocket Pig Games. I uh, love the company name. Uh, they do uh, a lot of custom 3D printed mindies. Uh, one by order or by bulk or in sets. So that's the words Rocket Pig and Games dot com and it's the same name on Patreon. So take a look at what they've got. Until next time, this is Jared Savage Daddy Gunning for Jib. Dave and Chris saying keep rolling and stay savage.